Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we continue on our study in, in Ezekiel 33, and consider carefully not only the words of Scripture, but the words of Sister White, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his blessing. Shall we join together now in a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We ask, Father, for your blessing, for your forgiveness of our sins, for your guidance and your direction, so that we may more clearly understand the task that is soon before us. Help us now in all things. May your will be done in our lives, in our meeting, in all things that you would have us to do. Direct us now. May your angels attend us as we join together in this meeting. May your spirit guide our minds, guide our conversation, and help us to understand that which we need to do so that we may be as unified as were the disciples after the time that Jesus returned to your courts. Be with us now. Direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before us, we have the document, Manuscript 50 of 1901. Now, in this situation, we have a non-published document where only portions of this were published. And this was written on the 9th of June of 1901. And the question that is asked in the title is, what shall we render to God? As we consider this, what is it that is important for us to render unto God? Now, well, in, well, in Romans twelve one and two, it says, "Um, uh, sac- what does it say? I beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God." Right? Are we not to render unto God our best service, our best of everything? Amen. Okay. In the 10th paragraph, Mrs. White states, I speak to you who know not God, who may read these words, for in the providences of God, they may be brought to your notice. What are you doing with the Lord's goods? What are you doing with the physical and mental powers he has given you? Have you the power to keep the human machinery in motion? Did God speak but one word? you would at once be still in death, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. God works by his infinite power to keep you alive. See the progression in this. Daily, hourly, minute. It is he who supplies the air which keeps the life in the body. Should God neglect man as man neglects God? What would become of the race? Without fresh air to breathe, the lungs, the avenues of life would be clogged. The food would be a minister of evil, and death would result. God spares the life of the sinner until he sees that the life will not be surrendered to him. The great medical missionary has an interest in the work of his hands. He presents before man the perils of closing the door of the heart against the Savior, saying, Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33.11 Now, this is now paired also because of the reference in Ezekiel 33 with the following. What has sustained Christians in every age amidst reproaches, temptations, and sufferings? A pure, trusting faith, constantly exercised, a committing of the keeping of the soul to God under any and every circumstance, and unto one whom they knew would not betray their trust. Our Creator will keep that which is committed unto Him against that day. Christ, by His sacrifice to save sinners, evidenced His great love for the human soul. 
He gave his life to secure our salvation. What an insult so many, deceived by Satan's temptations, offer to the Savior by abusing their privileges, refusing to acknowledge his loving interest in them. Yet he, their creator and redeemer, bears long with them in their persistent disdain of his mercies. As this matter is daily urged upon my mind, I am so astonished that I cannot hold my peace. I long to reach sinners and cry out to them, Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? How many of us have had our time where we knew not God, or we chose to walk in a path contrary to him? How often has he sent his spirit to contend with us. How grateful should we be that we are now learning more about him and accepting his paths for our own paths. Christ with his own blood. Amen. Thank you. Amen. It always amazes amazes me how God doesn't give up on us when when we give up and turn away from him and choose death. Right. Yeah, it's wonderful. Christ with his own blood has bought the whole human family. We are his purchased possession. He desires those who claim to believe in him to receive his power. That in this wicked and perverse generation, they may become sons of God and that they may reveal to a world entranced and corrupted by Satan that God is love, and that there is a difference, plain and distinct, between him who serveth God and him who serveth him not. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Do the sheep know the shepherd? And does the shepherd know those that are his? Now is our day of opportunity. Now all may come and be converted. Now the operative word here is may. Will all ever come to be converted? No. No. Now we may repent of sin. Never has there been a more solemn period in the history of those who have once heard the true song of the third angel's message. The third angel's message has yet to be given with clarity. It has yet to be shown to all what it truly means. This document was written to Mrs. White's nephew. Will you now, Frank Belden, seek the Lord earnestly with deep repentance that you have not had a sound, straightforward experience in the truth that it, as it is in Jesus? In a little while, the destiny of every soul will be internally fixed. God will not be mocked by an empty profession. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. It is high time to do a thorough work for eternity. You have a work to do that you have not yet done, a work that no one else can do for you. Can we ensure the salvation of others? Is salvation not a personal work? Is that a trick question? No. Because because in some sense, we can help others, but assure them of their salvation? No. We can pr- provide, <clears throat> you know, expose them to the promises and so on, help them be it, but yeah, no. Agreed. We cannot ensure anyone else's salvation we can sow the seed we can show through our lives what it means to truly be christian to take on christ's yoke but we cannot push anyone else to become christian to become like christ She continued in her message to her nephew. Do not, I beg of you, trifle longer. Now, while it is called today, the voice of mercy is heard. 
make a determined, sincere effort to press forward unto eternal life. Do not neglect or delay this work. The enemy is exerting his masterly power in an effort to keep you in darkness, that you and your family shall lose the present opportunity of obtaining eternal life. Obtaining life, eternal life. Now, the next document was written on the 4th of July of 1906. I found it interesting that the biblic on the biblical calendar, this would be the 11th day of the fourth month of the biblical year, 5951. But it would also be the 11th day of the fourth month of the rabbinic year, 5666. And was the 114th year of the French Republican calendar. In the visions of the night, I seem to be speaking with great earnestness before an assembly of people. A heavy burden was upon my soul. I was presenting before those gathered together the message of the prophet Ezekiel regarding the duties of the Lord's watchmen. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, a wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou speak not to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. What does it mean to be a watchman? What does it mean to, for us today to be a watchman? Those who are in God's word each day and are tr tracing him, so to speak, through the signs around us. Okay. Now. Was Father Miller a watchman? Yes, he was. Did he give a word of warning? Many words of warning. The prophets, as we observe, were also watchmen for their time. Here we are today. We are being called to be watchmen. We know the hour is late. <clears throat> we know that the sun is soon to rise. The duty of a watchman is one that is very, very solemn. As she continues, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus she speaks, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? This is presented over and over again for our admonition. It is not just the house of Israel that needs to reach, return to the Lord, to be forgiven of its evil ways. We are each being called to this. As was pointed out in the chat, we are being presented with the 411. We are being presented with a call for information. 
we are being given the information so that we may make a decision. The prophet had, by the command of God, ceased from prophesying to the Jews just at the time when the news came that Jerusalem was invaded and siege was laid unto her. In the 24th chapter of Ezekiel records the representation that was given to him of the punishment that would come upon all who would refuse the word of the Lord. The people were removed from Jerusalem and punished by death and captivity. No lot was to fall upon it to determine who should be saved and who destroyed. It wasn't the responsibility of the city. It was the responsibility of the individuals. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein, and whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece. Let no lot fall upon it. For her blood is in the midst of her. Therefore saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city. I will even make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire. In thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more, till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back. Neither will I spare. Neither will I repent. According to thy doings shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. Do we want to be judged according to the life that we have lived? No. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? We have a choice. We can either be judged according to our own doings, or we can be judged according to that which Christ did. Also, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I will take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn or weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and even, and at even my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us, that thou doest so? Then I answered them, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Speak unto the house of Israel. Thus said the Lord of God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters whom ye have left shall fall by the sword. And ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. And your tires shall be upon your head, and your shoes upon your feet. Ye shall not mourn nor weep, but ye shall pine away for your iniquities, and mourn one toward another. Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. According to all that he hath done shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. I am in I am instructed to present these words before those who have had light and evidence, but who have walked directly contrary to the light. The Lord will make the punishment of those who will not receive his admonitions and warnings as broad as the wrong has been. The purposes of those who have tried to cover their wrong, while they have secretly worked against the purposes of God, will be fully revealed. Truth will be vindicated. God will make manifest that he is God. So who is it that has had light and evidence? Who is it that has walked contrary to that great light? Me. Okay. I have. Now there's a comment from the chat that this passage is reminding them of Ezekiel 8.1, the sixth month, fifth day of the sixth year. 
when Ezekiel sat with the elders, he saw the abominations in Israel. What is so very important about Ezekiel 8, 1, and, and 9? Well, they're a reminder that we're in the sealing time and we need to be right with God. We need, we need to repent. Is this a corporate work? Is it, is it the church that needs to repent? We are the church. Repentance is an individual individual work. Corporate repentance is an interesting um, concept that I'm not, I haven't studied it enough to have an opinion on it, although I do, but yeah. Uh, and repentance is an individual work. Corporate repentance that the church needs to repent of their rejection of the 1888 message and so on. I don't know. It's not going to happen. God saves us one by one, according to our choices. Was the time yeah. that the yeah. apostles spent in the upper room a time of corporate repentance or of individual repentance? They came together individually. Right. This is what we are tasked with today. Many times we have walked contrary to light that has been given. The point has been made. The point has been presented that we are to reject all light that has come subsequent to 2012. I see this as rejecting light at our peril. Oh, man. Is it all, is it all light? Is that the idea being floated or is it? certain parts of the light what i heard was i, all I just light. can't yeah that's amazing to me i how how can we deny it was just so providential so many providential leadings and to not deny that that's an amazing thing mysterious thing really it is i mean i've denied light in the full blaze of light i've chosen to walk against it at times uh, as we all are in our fallen natures but knowingly but to be blindly rejecting light how great is that darkness I don't get it agreed there is a spirit of wickedness at work in the church that is striving at every opportunity to make void the law of God while the Lord may not punish unto death those who have carried their rebellion to great lengths, the light will never again shine with such convincing power upon the stubbornness, stubborn opposers of truth. Sufficient evidence is given to every soul regarding what is truth and what is error. But the deceptive power of evil upon some is so great that they will not receive the evidence and respond to it by repentance. So, what do we see here? There is calling, going to be... Calling, calling light darkness is what we're seeing. Right. It really sums up that verse. Jesus said, oh, how great is that darkness? We call light darkness. Now, this next letter, letter 122 of 1907. Written on the 1st of April of 1907. In this life, our riches are limited. But the great treasure that God offers in his gift to the world is unlimited. It comprehends every human desire and goes far beyond our human calculations. In the great day of final decision, when every man shall be judged by his record in the books of heaven, every voice will be hushed. It will be seen that in his gift to the human race, God gave all he had to give. And they are without excuse who have refused to accept the gracious offer of salvation. There are none that can say, I have been a good person. There are none that can say, I am without sin, except for Christ. We may be wealthy according to the world standards, but we are poor, blind, and naked according to God's. 
My soul is weighed down when I think of the careless and impenitent who have had great and wonderful light, but who do not grasp the opportunity they have of coming into obedience to the law of God. The ten holy precepts given amid demonstrations of power and grandeur from Mount Sinai by God himself declare the principles that rule in heaven. They were made known to man that he might understand the terms of entrance into the holy city, New Jerusalem. Only those who turn by repentance and conversion to a life of obedience to God are assured of a life of happiness and peace in the Father's home. To such the gates of the city are opened. The eternal substance is given them, and they inherit all things. We have to understand these 10 promises are the very baseline of the principles that are ruling in the heavenly courts. Yet if we reject one, we reject all. Now, my sister, I think your question is answered. Obedience to the commandments of God will secure you an entrance into the city of God. Speak to your brothers. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? But why should any choose to stand on the side of the great rebel to the loss of the soul? Tell your brother to prepare to meet the Lord. Be of good courage in the Lord. Press the battle to the gate. And when the gates of the city of God are thrown open, and the righteous nation which has kept the truth shall enter in. May you be numbered with that glad company, is my prayer. As the Millerites would say, may your name remain. There are many things that we need in our lives. First, for ourselves, we need to be fully converted, to be giving all to Christ then we need to come into unity with our brothers and sisters. From that, we then need by faith to walk as God would have us to walk. The Lord speaks the truth plainly, that we may understand our true condition and that we may overcome the objectionable features of our character. We have objectionable features in our character that have come inherited, and we have many that we have developed ourselves. Come into line. Repent. Repent ye, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3.19. Confess your sins with deep sorrow of heart. Leave the ways and works of Satan, and come to Christ with humility and repentance, with heartbroken and a contrite spirit. Exchange your life of wickedness for life of righteousness. Trust in the mercy of him who gave his life, that you might be saved, not in your sins, but by repentance and faith and confession from your sins. By your example, show to others what true repentance means and what conversion will do for a man. Let others see in you the power that comes from an active faith. Show the world how to become partakers of that glorious hope, which cannot be taken away. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Turn ye, turn ye, he says, for why will you die? Our past life with its mistakes is not a pleasant picture to look upon, but it must be held up to our view that we may desire something better. Do we agree or do we disagree with this statement? I agree. Amen. Kind of difficult to see it in black and white, isn't it? But it is true. <clears throat> it's true for us. From the Review and Herald, again, April 1, but of 1915, we read, The God whom we serve is long-suffering. His compassions fail not. Lamentations 3.22 Throughout the period of probationary time, his spirit is entreating men to accept the gift of life. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. 
turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? It is Satan's special device to lead man into sin and then leave him there helpless and hopeless, fearing to seek for pardon. But God invites, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. In Christ, every provision has been made and every encouragement offered. Are we willing today to make peace with God? In the days of apostasy in Judah and Israel, many were inquiring, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the most, the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? The answer is plain and positive. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Micah 6, 6 to 8. Consider this next verse. Ezekiel thirty three twelve. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. What does this mean to us? And what are we seeing presented here? Perhaps a clue would help me. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, speak up a little bit more. Excuse me. Uh, perhaps a clue would help me uh, go where you're thinking of. Well, what are we seeing? Is past righteousness, past righteousness going to serve, going to save someone that chooses sin over righteousness? No. Is past wickedness going to condemn those that turn from their wickedness? No, that's an interesting other side of the question. Yeah, that's, yeah, no. It's converted every day anew. Okay. In pamphlet 123, it is written, When Sister Smith confessed her errors in the spring of 1870, she had genuine sorrow and repentance. Her confession should have been received and encouragement and sympathy given, even if all thought she would not stand the test of proving and would again be found with her sympathies on the side of the unconsecrated. Whatever course it was feared she might pursue in the future should not have influenced our minds and controlled our actions at the time of this humiliation on the part of Sister Smith. The withholding of our sympathies from Sister Smith, the unbelief we manifested, was unbecoming the followers of Christ, who are dependent upon his love and mercy every hour. I was referred to Ezekiel 33, 10 through 12. Therefore, O, o thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus she speaks, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. The humiliation of Sister Smith and the hearty confessions made by her, God ever accepts and gives the one who thus humbles the heart before him another test, another trial, and proving. So here we are. 
if we have our if we have confessed our sins and those confessions have then been accepted by God which he promises to do and then gives the one who humbles the heart before him another test another trial and proving what's happening here i would have to think that it's giving another test to once they return repent right uh, purification that's happening i would agree sanctification well if we've confessed our sins are we not justified yes forgiven are we then in the, in the righteousness process, of christ are we then in the process of being made right? apologies for the delay in the audio but go ahead dwight sorry not a problem you're, you're just coming through very soft right now okay i'll use my outside voice <laughs> better okay good please better okay I, i'm i'll i'll remember that next time i have something to share but please go ahead confession is does that not lead us to justification repentance con- confession repentance forgiveness imparted righteousness and then imputed no imputed righteousness and then imparted through the process of sanctification is that about right Okay. Are we made white in the process of being made white through test and trial? For what is being made white? Is that not a symbol of purity? Purity, character, the glory of God begins to shine from the countenance of people who are in that process. Even though we have not arrived but god adds to or i don't know it's an old pastor once told me do our best and leave the rest to god i think that's true okay now in the chat the comment was made pamphlet 123 is this a symbol of the first second and third angel's message can we see this in that way? Yes, I see it there. So let's consider this. Let's contemplate on this for a while. Now, the next verse that we have, Ezekiel thirty-three thirteen. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, All his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. For his iniquity that he has committed, he shall die from it. What does that say to us? It says to me that our only hope is Christ. We cannot trust to our own righteousness. We don't have any. I agree. Is there anything else? Consider the example of the prophet that was told to come as a king of Israel was choosing to divide the worship. And he came to an altar. He gave a curse upon the altar. What was this prophet told to do? Was he to remain after presenting the curse? No, he was not. He was to uh, return back. Was he to return the way that he came? I think he was supposed to go another way. I ain't for sure about that. Why? No, you're right. He was to go another way. Yeah. But what was he also admonished not to do? Not not to accept was any to... gifts from a gift from. Mm. Mm-hmm. And what did he do? Well, he sat under the tree too long, one time. <clears throat> he accepted he the gifts, and then is it is this the one uh, where the bear comes and, or some animal comes and kills him? 
Let's look at it. The prophet that didn't direct. Yeah. First Kings 13. <clears throat> he right. went and lodged with the guy and ate with him. He shouldn't have. He shouldn't even have listened to somebody who was giving him instructions contrary to what God had told him. So here, the man of God comes to, to confront Jeroboam, right? First Kings 13. This prophet came and he ate with a false prophet, is what is pointed out in the chat. And that's correct. First Kings 13, 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. What is Bethel? What does the name mean? Beth, 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 Bethlehem. What, what does it mean? I forget. Okay. Oh, Beth. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Beth meaning house of L, God. God's house was where Jeroboam had erected an altar. Jeroboam was king and was choosing to offer, make offerings on this altar. Was that the point that a king should be doing? No, it's not. It's the priest up to the priest. So here's Jeroboam setting himself up not only as a false priest, he is going against the word of God. This man of God comes and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign that same day saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord by God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and it became as it was before. So was this, well, this was a true prophet, right? This was a prophet that prayed, seeing the signs that Jeroboam had not done what he should do, yet he prayed on Jeroboam's behalf to God. Was it a miracle that Jeroboam's arm was restored? Yeah, for sure. Was this a true prophet? What does the Bible say? Which prophet was it? Doesn't say the name. Is it uh, not uh, the disobedient prophet? That one? Okay. That's My point is, this was a righteous man. He was a man that had been given an instruction by God. He followed God's instruction. Therefore, at that point, I would have to say that this was a true prophet because he was following what God had told him to do. And the man of God besought the Lord and the king's hand was restored again and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God. Yes, because it's a rent pocket. Okay. And the king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go with me, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. 
So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Was he doing what he had been told by God at this point? Yes, he was doing uh, as God commanded him to do. Yes, he was doing what he was told to do. But as we see in the balance of the chapter, this prophet, this righteous man, who had been told, eat no bread, drink no water, return a different way than you come. He chose not to do so. And for that disobedience, he died. Here is a direct example of what's being referred to here in Ezekiel 33, 13. Brothers and sisters, we have come to the point where our time for this study is over. Consider carefully the lessons that we have addressed from Ezekiel 33, verses 12 and 13. When we return this next week, we will address this in further detail. Comment from the, from the chat is a reminder of Galatians 3.1. The people here were being asked, who has bewitched you? The question that we have before us today, who has bewitched us that we are not willing to repent and to come into unity. Any other thought or question at this time? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these many lessons so that we may learn more and be guided by you. Direct us today. Help us that what we do may be according to your will. We thank you for these hours of Sabbath rest. We need you now, Father. Direct us. Bless us in all that you would have us to do. Show us that, that we need to surrender to you so that we may come into unity with you and with each other. Bless the meeting that is to come after Direct our steps this Sabbath day. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.